Welcome to part three of my chapter 11 lecture. We're starting with section 11.12 with the most interesting topic of cloning plants and animals. Okay, so plants have long been able, or people have long been able to clone plants. And the ability to clone plants shows that cells which are differentiated might still contain all of the the entire genome. And that was a big question for a long time is whether, you know, um, the specific expression of genes meant that certain cells contained would lose the ability to um, produce all of the proteins that were initially present in the genome. And so a clone is just an organism that is created by asexual reproduction and is genetically identical to a parent. Um, any cell that has the ability to produce every single kind of specialized cell in an organism is called totipotent. Totipotent. And then this term regeneration just has to do with the regrowth of lost body parts and that demonstrates that perhaps even with cell differentiation, an animal's ability to be cloned is still possible. So um, plants, if you take a cutting, a lot of times you can, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of plants that can do this. You can take a cutting, stick it in water, stick it in the soil and keep it wet and, and it will produce roots and make a whole new plant. In carrots, you can take a single cell from the actual root or carrot part of the plant and grow it in a culture medium and it will actually differentiate and form a whole new adult carrot plant. That would be a clone. Okay, so in animals, what I was talking about with regeneration is just that certain salamanders, lizards, newts, and things like that, if they lose a tail or a leg, a lot of times can regrow the lost body parts. So that kind of gave scientists some hope to be able to clone a full organism. Okay, so here is a checkpoint question. How does the cloning of plants from differentiated cells support the view that differentiation is based on the control of gene expression rather than on irreversible changes in the genome? Well, the answer is just that if you have a differentiated cell and you're able to produce a whole new plant, such as in the carrot we talked about, then that means that that cell, even though it was differentiated, it still had the genetic information and ability to be able to differentiate into all of the cell types that are present in carrot plants. Okay, so when it comes to cloning animals, it the process is more difficult and more complicated. The process that's used is called nuclear transplantation. And so in order to clone an animal, you would have to take DNA from a donor cell and insert it into a host egg cell that has no nucleus and therefore no DNA. And so that would result in cloning of the DNA from the donor cell. If the animal that is being cloned is a mammal, then the blastocyst, which is um, a stage in the development very early on just after the zygote, that blastocyst is implanted into the uterus of a surrogate mother. And that type of cloning is called reproductive cloning because it can actually result in the birth of a new living individual. This is just showing that process of implanting the blastocyst or ball of cells um, into a surrogate mother, in this case a sheep. The very first animal to be successfully cloned happened about 46 years after scientists began 
um, using cells from frog embryos to try to successfully clone an organism. In 1996, there was a Scottish scientist and a group of researchers. The scientist's name was Ian Wilmot, and they actually combined the two um, techniques of nuclear transplantation and reproductive cloning to first successfully clone a sheep called Dolly, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of. And what they found was that even though they were successful in cloning the sheep, that um, Dolly at the age of six started to experience certain um, health issues that were thought to be related to the fact that she was cloned. So it's thought that cloned animals are actually less healthy than those that are naturally arising from a fertilized egg. In 2003, they had to euthanize Dolly because she had complications from a lung disease that usually only occurs in much older sheep. And so sheep normally have a life expectancy of 12 years, but she was only six at the time. So other cloned animals have shown other issues that usually show up only in older animals like arthritis, um, the susceptibility to obesity, pneumonia, liver failure, and premature death. So that is kind of an interesting downside of cloning. Moving on to section 11.14, there are, this last part of the lecture is going to be all about different potential and existing medical applications of cloning, and one of them is called, a broad category is just called therapeutic cloning, and that's just when stem cells, especially embryonic stem cells derived from the umbilical cord, um, are used for medical applications like helping to cure inherited diseases. There hasn't been a lot of success in 05. There were some doctors that reported using therapeutic cloning with embryonic stem cells to help cure some babies of a, an inherited disorder of the nervous system called Crabs disease. But most attempts at using the umbilical cord blood therapy have been unsuccessful to date. Um, eventually these cells may be able to be used therapeutically, but there's still a lot more research that needs to be done in order to do that. Um, there are also adult stem cells and they're similar to embryonic stem cells and that they can differentiate into different types of cells. Um, adult stem cells are further down the path of differentiation, so they cannot give rise to as many different cell types, but scientists have learned to isolate them and to be able to culture some of them in the lab. And there is a lot of research being done on both embryonic stem cell and adult stem cells being used for therapeutic cloning. Okay, so here's a good checkpoint question. How do embryonic stem cells differ from adult stem cells? Embryonic stem cells differ from adult stem cells in that they are less far down the path of differentiation compared to adult stem cells and therefore can give rise to more cell types compared with adult stem cells, which are farther down that path and can give rise to fewer cell types. Okay, so we're going to move on to talking about the genetics of cancer and then talk about how some of these things can be used in order to potentially help cure cancer. Okay, so cancer is the result of genetic mutations that are in genes that control cell division. We talked about cancer when we talked about mitosis being caused by uncontrolled cell division or unregulated cell division. And if you have a mutation in a gene that controls or that produces a protein that controls cell division and that gene is changed by a mutation, um, then that can lead to cancer. So you could have a mutation of what's called a proto-oncogene and if and that's a normal gene that helps regulate or control cell division 
And if that mutation changes that particular gene into an oncogene, which is a cell that would cause cells to divide excessively, then that can cause the production or the growth of tumors. Okay, so there are also mutations in genes that are called tumor suppressor genes. And if you have a mutation that, that inactivates a tumor suppressor gene, that can be the underlying genetic cause of cancer. And this is just a diagram illustrating that. So if you have this proto-oncogene for a protein that stimulates cell division, and you had a mutation in that gene that changes it into an oncogene, then you can have hyperactive growth um, of stimulating protein in a normal amount. Um, if you have the gene and it's not mutated, you just have multiple copies of the gene, then you can have the normal growth stimulating protein in excess also leading to cancer. Then if you have a mutation within the control region of DNA in this promoter and it's mutated, it can also lead to the normal growth stimulating protein being present excessively leading to tumor production cancer. Okay, so um, different types of cancer can result from a series of changes in the genome. Um, colon cancer is an example of cancer that illustrates a gradual progression from a somatic mutation to actual cancer. So um, at the genetic level, you have DNA changes that lead to the activation of an oncogene, and then you have cellular changes, which would be increased cell division, leading to tumor production. Um, when you have an oncogene being activated, um, which leads to increased cell division, and a tumor suppressor gene being inactivated, which can also lead to a polyp or a benign tumor being produced. And then you have a second tumor suppressor gene being inactivated, which can lead to the growth of a malignant tumor. So this diagram is just showing how that can, uh, colon cancer can progress um, through different stages where it becomes worse and worse or more severe. Section 11.18 talks a little bit more about cancer and lifestyle choices. Cancer is the second leading cause of death after heart disease in most industrialized nations. And most kinds of cancer happen because of mutations which are caused by environmental factors. Um, those environmental factors that alter DNA and make cells cancerous are called carcinogens. And obviously reducing exposure to carcinogens can help reduce the risk of cancer. And so um, there are certain things that can increase the risk of cancer, um, like using tanning beds, um, smoking, you know, using tobacco, different forms of tobacco and things like that. Um, and so just, you know, keep in mind that you can get information about different types of carcinogens and there are ways for some known carcinogens, no, some, but not all, there are ways that you can reduce your exposure and thereby reduce your risk of getting cancer. This is figure 11.18 from your book. And it is just looking at some of the data and kind of putting that together with like, okay, which, which types of these cancer can you get early screenings to and which ones are responsible for the highest mortality. And it breaks it down uh, by different risk factors, alcohol, diet, um, gender, uh, genetics, obesity, pollution, radiation, smoking, sun exposure, STIs, viruses. And so the ones that are, that have early screening available are the ones in blue, the ones in yellow are ones that are not. And so you have, you know, testicular cancer, um, it doesn't have a very high mortality rate, but definitely early screening is available. Then you have cervical cancer and there are a number 
of lifestyle risks or risk factors associated with cervical cancer. And yes, early screening is available. Um, let's see, ovarian cancer does not.